Okay, chapter three of the seventh edition of the NASM, a personal training certification textbook. And chapter three is on the psychology of exercise. Um, and so this chapter is sort of a, a prelim to what's gonna be coming up next when it comes to lifestyle behavior change. So chapter three, the psychology of exercise, an important component of <clears throat> how we how we help individuals through the through the challenge of just uh, basic motivation and and those elements that are going to help with changing their lifestyle. As a for instance, remember um, as always, have your pad and writing implement. You're going to need it um, here in chapter three, as your as in subsequent chapters as well. A lot more than the than the previous two sort of introductory chapters. And the reason is going to be because of the of some of the tables. Um, that are that are really important to uh, to memorize. And so chapter three begins with the role of psychology. And again, it's it's um it's interesting because the fitness industry has really changed in a lot of ways. And one of the ways is in this uh, need to get more into the into the peop into a person's client's brain. Right, and this is where the psychology of training has really, really come forward. We have to help people to um, to appreciate the need for training, the need for eating well, and um, that can be really, really difficult. And so, the more we understand psychology of exercise, the psychology of of a wellness based lifestyle, the more we understand that. The better, uh, the better equipped you're going to be to actually navigate through this process of helping your clients to um, to make the necessary necessary changes. Again, chapter three is for the most part a sort of a prelim, but there are there are terms that you're going to need to need to memorize and need to understand so that as you move into subsequent uh, the subsequent chapters on lifestyle behavior modification. Um, you'll you'll get that uh, you'll get that a little bit a little bit better. So the learning objectives in chapter three, uh, common reasons why people avoid regular exercise, social influences on on exercise adherence. Okay, some of these terms, by the way, are critical. Exercise adherence. Um, you know why are people going to continue? You can start people can start training. But are they going to uh, continue and maintain and maintain their training? It's called exercise adherence. Uh, uh, the best forms of support to help people stick with their exercising and uh, the psychological benefits of regular exercise. Just so you know, a lot of this information is sort of intuitive. If you exercise and you work out, um, it's sometimes it's hard to appreciate or or even believe that people don't find it important or necessary or even or even um, enjoyable to exercise, okay? But that's that's what a chapter like this is doing for you. It's pulling you out of your, your particular little world where you like to exercise, you enjoy the way to understand that for the vast majority of people, um, they don't particularly like exercising, nor do they want to engage in it, but they know they need to just as a, for instance, but I don't wanna get ahead of myself, um, so the role of psychology and, and you'll, you'll, uh, read through a little bit here on, you know, the difference, the science of psychology, the psychiatrist versus the psychologist, um, not as necessary as, as you may think, but when you get to page 62, now we're getting into some of the meat and potatoes of what we really need to know, which is this concept of motivation. Um, and the different types of motivation or the two main types, intrinsic and extrinsic, right? So extrinsic uh, being those, <clears throat> those variables that affect people from the outside world that get them to do, right? That's extrinsic, extrinsic motivation. So, you know, the rewards of working out, feeling better, right? Those are, those can be ex, um, extrinsic variables versus intrinsic motivation, which is sort of this innate internal desire to exercise and to feel better, um, look better, for instance, although those are rewards, there is this intrinsic desire to want to exercise. Um, and so NASM gives you 
you know, a little explanation, somebody that has intrinsic motivation says, I like to exercise because I enjoy, you know, taking care of my health and well-being. That's, you know, that's great. Intrinsic motivation is normally considered to be um, anything that gives a um, sort of this uh, personal desire to exercise just for the sake and enjoyment of doing it. Um, entrance, extrinsic motivation can lead to, over time, can lead to intrinsic motivation. Um, some folks, for instance, have a, have a health scare, right? They have a heart attack, whatever the case is, and um, they don't particularly like to exercise, but they do it because of this extrinsic motivation to do it. Right. And, uh, and so they start to do it. And as they do it, they start to notice that they actually start to feel better. And in fact, they actually like to meet at the gym or wherever they're training and, you know, be social. And then all of a sudden, slowly but surely, they sort of develop this innate desire to actually do it so that when they wake up in the morning, um, they feel bad if they they don't do it, right? If you don't get your workout in, I'm sure many of you probably feel like that, right? You got to get that workout in. Well, that's actually an intrinsic desire, an intrinsic motivation to participate in exercise. But that's a very general way of describing it. Um, extrinsic motivation to exercise can come from all these different outside variables, rewards, things like that. Once an individual gets into the gym, for instance, there are ways to motivate um, or increase the extrinsic motivation, i.e. through music and the slap on the back and the high fives and, and the other things that go into the environment that enhances motivation. But this is more about um, actually beginning or starting or basic adherence um, to, to exercise. So that's what page 63 um, and 64 gets into a little bit with you. And then um, understanding how uh, motivation differs and then common barriers to exercise. So you got to slow down a little bit at this point on page 65 and, and kind of read through what the common barriers to exercise are. Because as you now move into the, the remainder of this chapter, you're going to want to take down some notes and write some of these, some of these uh, bits of information down so that you get a real a good appreciation for what we do know about why people don't want to exercise. And the first one is time, right? I don't have enough time. I'm a, I, I have a busy life. I'm doing a lot of different things and I don't have the time to do it. Well, that's what is considered a barrier to exercise. So knowing, by the way, knowing what they actually are is more critical. So what I would do is I would write down barriers to exercise and I would make a list. Time, right? Unrealistic goals. And, and here's your listing now. And this is, this is what you want to read through and make sure you, you know and memorize what these barriers are. Lack of social support. You know, your family doesn't support it. Your, your wife, your husband, whatever the case is, your parents, whatever it is, they don't provide you social support. In other words, they're not, they're not you know, giving you the high five and patting you on the back and saying, congrats for starting an exercise program. Um, there's also what's known as social physique anxiety. Um, when a person has, you know, insecurity about how they look or they have an insecurity about what they're wearing and they're going into one of the reasons why health clubs, by the way, um, can be very intimidating is because of this social physique anxiety issue that people have, you know, um, what do I have to wear? And when I wear these things, I feel really uncomfortable and very insecure. And that's, by the way, that's one of the reasons, interestingly enough, why people go to personal trainers or go to bo uh, boutique training centers is because of this. They don't want to be around a lot of people, right? Um, and definitely understand that. And so that's just one of the barriers barriers to people. So because of that, then, then individuals basically say, well, I'm just not even going to exercise. And then they try to do it at home. And we know that that's a bit of a challenge for people to to train the right way, train correctly, train at the appropriate level of intensity if they do it at home. It can be done, but again, we want people to come and uh, participate in, in supervised training where the trainer can show, teach, and provide the level of intensity and interest that will help them. Convenience, 
Um, and then of course the big one, again, convenience being a barrier to exercise, ambivalence, okay? And this is what helps people, um, or excuse me, helps the trainer to move into a better understanding of the stages of change model ambivalence. Um, you know, the way I normally explain <laughs> ambivalence is um, I love you, I hate you. It's this conflicting, it's this conflicting uh, mental state that a person gets in when, we, when we're talking about a particular um, subject or person or entity. Um, it's this conflicting feelings you have about something. It's called ambivalence. And it really is helpful to know not only what it is, but how you can help people navigate past it. And so um, there's a little sidebar. It describes a person's state of mixed feelings about a situation. Well, actually, it's not just about a situation. It's about other people, things, um, environmental factors. We, um, we develop this ambivalence, isolating it, knowing it, believe it or not, it's in this chapter, but boy, I'll tell you what, it, um, it's so, so beneficial as you get through the rest of the rest of the textbook. So knowing ambivalence, knowing how to deal with it is going to be, it's going to be really helpful. So you definitely want to want to read through that. And then what are the social influences on exercise? Remember, chapter three is all about the psychology of training. And so um, this is really beneficial in the real world. This is where we get to these ideas of support. What are the different types of support? And I'm going to just gear you immediately to table three, two types of social support. And there's four of them that you need to, that you need to memorize and should be able to rewrite. And again, what I do is I take the table and I will literally draw the table out. And this is my recommendation and literally rewrite this table word for word. Okay. Once you do that, Go ahead and redo it again. Redo it and redo it as many times as you can until you can basically do this. Types of support and do it without even looking at it. That's your goal when it comes to studying these, um, these tables. Once you're able to do that over and over and over again, you're going to have, you will have memorized it. So you'll realize that instrumental support is, you know, something like uh, getting, uh, getting a ride to the gym, just as a, for instance, if you don't have a car. So transportation, emotional support, encouraging someone. And, and of course, on a, an exam question, you'll be asked or given a situation just as a, for instance, and you'll be asked, what kind of, what kind of support is this client, is this client getting, or what kind of support does this client need? You should know those things because it becomes important in the, in the real world. And then NASM will go through in chapter three, an explanation of each of those types of support. And then um, on page 73, you're going to get into group influences on exercise. Remember psychology, um, family, family um, issues, parental, exercise leaders. Again, table 3.3 three is a good, um, is a really good table that you should, that you should memorize. So leaders, qualities, leaders, leadership styles, situational factors and uh, followers qualities. You definitely want to, again, memorize table three. I'm gonna write it down and I'm gonna look at that. I'm gonna go leaders qualities, okay? And I'm gonna write down the leader should offer a great example, uh, blah, blah, blah. And that's what you would, that's what you would do um, as you're going through uh, page 75. And then the exercise group. And here we're getting into this idea that group training the group training model is really an ideal scenario um, to help people to be, uh, to be and then to maintain motivation and exercise adherence. So table three, four, the benefits of training in groups. Now, I'm not saying you have to memorize table three, four, but what I would recommend is that you be able to at least speak to, you know, each one of these reasons. If, um, you know, if I was to basically ask you um, um, competition, what's the benefit of competition, you know, you know, in group exercise? Well, group exercise provides this level of competition that you don't find in one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one training. Um, camaraderie, for instance, consistency, energy. Look, we know in the real world, at the end of the day, for the vast majority of people, it's one of the reasons why, why we generally recommend doing group training, not just from the um, uh, 
development of, of higher revenue, right? But also from these reasons as well, people are more motivated. They like to come in. Even if you're not a social person, generally having two or three other people that you can work with might, might provide some uh, competition. And uh, I don't get that when I train in my house. I don't get that when I'm watching a video on TV. Again, not saying that those are those are not things that you can do, but what we're trying to help you, what Nazem's trying to help you understand is that there are some really good benefits to group exercise because there's a psychological component to this, the community, psychological benefits of exercise, promotes positive, positive mood. Some of these I think are self-evident. Um, you do need to know sort of the definition of self-esteem and what is it about body image that's important to, to know when it comes to personal training. Well, here's, here's a, um, here's a rundown and explanation of that. What else does it, what are the other uh, benefits then that you can, um, that you can see from training and in group training as particular? Well, NASM gives you a list, right? Improves sleep, reduces depression and anxiety. Just listing those, knowing those as variables is really what's important. Of course, read it, and understand it, but some of this stuff is intuitive, I, I would think, and um, and you would already know it. But again, knowing that it's part of a uh, part of a grouping of variables under a particular heading is what you want to is what you want to get and write down from chapter three, uh, the chapter summary and chapter review. Important to read those as well as the highlights, and um, that's going to take care of chapter three. We look forward to seeing you in chapter four.